Hello, and welcome to Lecture 4 of the Forces Unit of Phys 1104. In this lecture, we're going to meet an equation that we'll call the Equation of Motion, but which you've probably already met in other courses and know by a different name. Well, we know that the vector sum of forces is the time rate of change of momentum, and I've been writing that as a delta p over delta t, but of course that's an average time rate of change of momentum, and so rather awkwardly I then have to write that it's the average vector sum of the forces. Well, we know what to do with this. We take the limit as our time interval goes to zero, and now we have an instantaneous rate of change of momentum, which is equal to now the instantaneous vector sum of forces. And as usual, if I don't say average, I mean instantaneous, and so I won't usually say instantaneous instantaneous. That, by definition, is the time derivative of the momentum of the object. And notice that I'm stressing that this is the vector sum of a bunch of forces, all the forces, on one object, and it equals the time rate of change of the momentum of that object. So for some object O being acted upon by forces due to a bunch of different objects, one, two, three, and so on, we can write it in a summation notation like this, which just means that it's some force due to one on O plus a force due to two on O and so on. All those subscripts indicating the target are a little awkward, and since they're all the same subscript, I'm going to drop them temporarily. I'll bring them back later to remind you of them because they're important. So we have this rate of change of momentum is the vector sum of forces on the object. And that momentum, of course, is just an inertia times a velocity. And we're going to work with situations where the inertia is constant, so we can pull it out in front of the derivative. Well, we know what a dv by dt is. That's an acceleration, and this is now the form of this equation that you're probably familiar with. I'll often write it this way, and these two forms of the equation have different advantages. The first one is more convenient for calculations, but the second one emphasizes this cause and effect relationship, that the forces are causing the acceleration, but the size of the acceleration that results is inversely proportional to the inertia of the object. And of course, this is all written in terms of vectors. We can write it in components as well. But don't forget that these are forces acting on one object O and causing that object to accelerate. So these are all forces due to a bunch of different agents, but acting on the target, which is this object. And they add up to the inertia of this object O times its acceleration. This equation governs the motion of this object O, right? As, well, as long as we know the acceleration and the initial velocity and position, we can figure out all the motion subsequently. And so we call this the equation of motion. You probably know it as Newton's second law. Technically, that's not quite correct. The equation we started out with, that the time derivative of the momentum is the vector sum of the forces, is really the thing that's called Newton's second law. This that we have here is a special case for a constant inertia. So I'm going to call it the equation of motion partly because that's technically more correct, but also because it's just a better description of what this equation does. Quick unit analysis is in order because we need to know about the units of forces. So we have a sum of forces, which certainly has the units of a force, and that equals an inertia times an acceleration. Well, so on this side, we have an inertia in kilograms times an acceleration in meters per second squared. And that is apparently the units of a force. We define one newton, that is the name of this force, as one kilogram meter per second squared. So you can think of it as the force that will cause a one kilogram object to accelerate at one meter per second squared. Let's look at a cart being pulled by a string. And 
let's say that there is a force being exerted on it by this string 1, which we know is 3 newtons to the right. And let's figure out the acceleration. This is going to be very simple. So on the free body diagram, we know that we've got this. And we also know that this cart is in contact with the track. And additionally, the Earth is going to exert a gravitational force on it. So we'll have some F track on cart contact and some gravitational force due to the Earth on the cart. Now there could also be a little friction due to the track, and so that would make this force due to the track tip a little back. But let's assume that friction is negligible, and so this force due to the track is just straight up. We know that this cart ought to be accelerating this way. And what that tells us is that in this vector sum, these two forces here are canceling each other out. They have a vector sum to zero, and all we've got left is this force due to our string one. And so that is now our vector sum, and we can simply say that our acceleration of this cart is just that F1C over the inertia of this cart, which I've set to one kilogram. And so we're going to have three newtons over one kilogram. We're going to have three meters per second squared right. You can go through all the same arguments with this cart. Again, you're going to have a force due to the track and a force due to the earth, a gravitational force due to the earth, which cancel, and all that's left is this force back this way due to string two. And again, your acceleration is just going to work out to be that force divided by the inertia, and so it's going to be negative one meter per second squared to the left. Now, when you have both forces acting, so now we've got both strings attached and we're applying the same forces using each of them, now we have to pay attention to this vector sum. I'm again going to ignore the upward force due to the track and the downward gravitational force because we know they should cancel out here. And so now our acceleration of the cart is going to be the sum of those two. So we're going to have 3i hat minus 1i hat newtons over our 1 kilogram. And so that's going to give us 2i hat newtons divided by kilograms is going to be meters per second squared. And so notice that the vector sum of the forces has, a resu has resulted in an acceleration that is in fact the vector sum of the individual accelerations that would have resulted from these two forces acting individually. What does a scale measure? You're probably inclined to say it measures weight, but think about that. If you're standing on a bathroom scale and someone walks over and pushes down on your shoulders, you know that the scale will read a higher reading. Did you just gain weight? Clearly not. So if you step off the scale and press down on it with your hand, you can make it read a wide variety of readings. What the scale is reading is how hard you're pressing down on it, what the magnitude of the force you are exerting on it is. Or equivalently, because this is an interaction pair, it would be telling you the magnitude of the force it is exerting back up on your hand. So that's what a scale measures. It tells you what the upward force is that it is exerting on the thing on top of it. 
let's now think of an object O sitting on the scale. We know that the only thing the object is touching is the scale, and so our only forces should be the force that the scale exerts on this object and the gravitational force by the Earth. And very conveniently, the scale tells us what this force is. So here's our free body diagram, and the object is just sitting there, so the acceleration is zero, and here's our equation of motion. But that acceleration is zero, so that simplifies the equation rather a lot. And that means that the force that the scale exerts on the object is equal in magnitude to the force of gravity that the Earth is exerting on the object. And so indirectly we've been able to measure the force that gravity is exerting on this object. Note, we haven't directly measured it. We've measured the force that the scale is exerting on the object, but we've set up a situation where that is equal in magnitude to the gravitational force exerted on the object by the Earth. Now let's use this to do an experiment about gravitational forces. You can easily double the amount of matter on your scale. Just use two identical objects instead of one. And so you've doubled the amount of matter. And what you find experimentally is that this somewhat indirectly measured gravitational force doubles when you do that. Well, the amount of matter is what we call mass. Oh, hey, I used the word mass, not inertia. Remember, this is the amount of matter in an object. It's not its resistance to acceleration we're talking about. So I'm going to call that mass, and I'll use a capital M for it. And what this experiment shows is that the strength of the gravitational force that the Earth exerts on an object is proportional to the object's mass. So you could write it as some constant times the mass. So now let's think about a falling object, O. It's not touching anything except the air, and as long as it's not moving too fast, the forces that the air exerts on it are small, and we can ignore them. So the only force on our free body diagram is the gravitational force due to the Earth. And what's more, we know that the acceleration of this object is just g down. And so our equation of motion looks like this. And we already know that this gravitational force is some constant times the mass. So think of what that means. We can carry out this experiment with two objects, 1 and 2. And so we'll have that m1g is k times its capital M1. And we know that with our object 2, with some different inertia and some different mass, we'll have this. Well, if we just divide the one by the other, divide the one equation by the other, we have that the ratio of the inertias is equal to the ratio of the masses. And so that means inertia is proportional to mass, which now says either they're the same thing, which would be quite a coincidence, or at least that we're free to choose units where it's a one-to-one -one proportionality. And so that is what we do. We use the kilogram as both the unit of inertia and of mass. And the reason why this works is ultimately a deep mystery, and we don't really understand why this is true. What this does mean is that we have a nice simple relationship for gravitational force. The gravitational force that the Earth exerts on any object is just that object's inertia, which we can now also call its mass, because we've just established it's the same thing, times the acceleration due to gravity.